let us pray. Lord, we come before you this morning and we thank you for the book of Revelation, Lord. We thank you for the blessing that comes to us as a result of studying this book, reading, meditating upon this book, Lord. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you guide us this morning. Okay. You instruct us, Lord. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to understand the truth mm -hmm. and to apply that to our daily lives. Amen. 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 Well, today uh, we are going to continue with uh, chapter 13. We are going to finish that chapter today. So as you see on the board, we are going to talk about Antichrist and the false prophet. Now, Revelation chapter 13 is a very important chapter. This chapter is full of detail and insight into the main characters of the Great Tribulation. In this chapter, this chapter gives us understanding of what's going on. In the second part of the Great Tribulation, the events that take place during that time. Now, as we know, the Great Tribulation <laughs> is described in chapters 6 through 19 of the book of Revelation. Uh, it is a period of seven years of affliction and distress, suffering and pain, tribulation and trials, when God pours out his wrath on those who rejected the gospel of grace, those who rejected the message of mercy, and those who rejected the invitation to accept Jesus Christ as their personal savior. Jesus Christ, the only savior of the world. In other words, God pours out his wrath on those who are left behind after the Lord Jesus take, takes up his bride, the church. How do we know that the church goes to heaven before the tribulation? Well, the famous verse, we know we have many verses, but the famous one is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. Uh, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So praise the Lord, the church is in heaven before the tribulation. Now, in chapter 12, we saw that Satan was cast out of heaven. There was a war between Michael the archangel, if you remember, and the dragon. And he was cast out of heaven. Now, this day, Satan... He's on the earth, back and forth, but he has the right to go to heaven. He brings accusation, condemnation. He talks about us. He condemns us. But in that time of great tribulation, we will see that he will be cast out, no longer having access to heaven. Now, he gets very angry, furious, enraged. And now, in chapter 13, we see that we see Satan's final attempt to cause the whole world to worship him. He knows that his time is very short. Now, in Revelation 13, we see that we have one beast, in verse 1, coming out of the sea. And one beast, the other beast, coming up out of the earth. The first beast coming out out of the sea, and we discussed that the sea represents a people, multitudes, nations, and tongues, according to Revelation 17, verse 15, that in other words, the, the sea of Gentile nation, the sea of humanity. The second beast comes out of the earth, now, many Bible scholars believe that the earth represents the land of Israel. And the false prophet, this beast, is coming out of the earth. That means he has Jewish roots. It doesn't mean he's going to live in Israel. He 
probably lives in the different country, but has Jewish descent, Jewish roots. So the first beast is the head of the revived Roman Empire. This beast, the first beast, is a worldwide political leader, Antichrist. The second beast is the false prophet. He will be the worldwide religious leader. So we are going to review and add a few more things about Antichrist, then we will go to the false prophet. Antichrist, this prefix anti in Greek language has two meanings. It means against, and also it means in place of. So Antichrist is against Christ, opposing Christ, but also in place of Christ, pretending to be Christ. Antichrist will be the great world leader and people will love and accept him and applaud him. Why? Because he starts with peace. He starts with peace and he will promise and he will bring peace in the Middle East, but for a very short period of time. Now, remember in Revelation chapter 6, verse 2, Antichrist, he comes on a white horse. On a white horse, he pretends to be Christ. Now, um, we know from Daniel's chapter 2, chapter 9, verse 27, that Antichrist will make a covenant with the Jewish nation, with the Jew, to protect them for seven years. This protection will allow the nation of Israel to build the new temple, to rebuild the tem temple and to start the religious ritual and ceremonies. But in the middle of the seven years, that means after three years and a half, we are now in that period in our study, chapter 13, Antichrist will break that covenant. He will stop the religious ceremonies and he will set himself up as God in the temple, demanding worship. <coughs> Jesus calls this the abomination of desolation in Matthew 24, um, in chapter 24, and we will go there in a little while. I want to bring to your attention a very important verse from 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. Now here we have Paul, and he uh, talks about Antichrist, but he doesn't use that word. So let's read. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, notice, Paul did not use the term Antichrist in this letter. We have Apostle John that uses the term Antichrist in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 for your notes. You don't have time to go through every verse. And also in 2 John, verse 7, Paul uses for Antichrist, he uses the term the man of sin, a son of perdition. Son of perdition is used only two times in the Bible for Judas Iscariot and for Antichrist. Now we need to keep in mind, now we know at the Bible study, we study the book of First Thessalonians and we will continue with the second. When, when Paul wrote First Thessalonians in 50 AD, Second Thessalonians in 51 AD, after a short period of time. But now Paul, uh, John, he wrote First and Second John late in his life the book of Revelation around 95, 96 AD. So you see, God um, gave us, as I said before, the revelation about end time in stages so we can understand. So we get the total picture of Antichrist and the false prophet when we take 
uh, when we study the whole counsel of the Bible, not only Revelation, we go to Daniel, we go to John, we go to the writings of Paul, we take in consideration the whole counsel of God. So, as I said, Antichrist means in the place of God and against God. This Antichrist is the opposite of Christ. Now we all know that Jesus went about doing good. That means Antichrist will go around doing bad. Then we know that uh, Jesus spoke the truth. Antichrist is going to speak only lies. You know, he will be like an angel of light, as the Bible says. Now, I believe, and other Bible scholars believe, that Antichrist will be on the scene before the rapture of the church. He will be a peaceful political leader. And he will uh, unite ten nations from the European nations, and he will, he will create a strong alliance, a strong power block, strong coalition. So first we see that Antichrist is a peacemaker. At the beginning, he will bring a short period of peace in the Middle East. Second, he will be a protector. He will protect the nation of Israel. They'll be able to build the temple. But uh, after that, he will be a peace breaker. So he starts as a peaceful leader. But in the middle of the great tribulation, he will be a peace breaker. He will take over the temple. He will reveal his true character by trying, uh, taking over the Jewish, the, the temple. He will organize a worldwide church, forcing people to worship him. So this antichrist will be empowered, energized by Satan or the dragon. And he will seek worship, just like the dragon, Satan, he was seeking worship. Nobody on earth will be able to overcome Antichrist, only the Lord Jesus, with the breath of his mouth. Okay. In Revelation 13, verse 4, we read, who, will, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Well, in that time, nobody. Only when Jesus comes on his second coming. So again, Antichrist will be a peacemaker, a protector, peacebreaker. And then he will be a persecutor. He will persecute the Jews and the Gentile believers. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 21 to 32. Now this is Jesus. He's saying, for there will be great tribulation, such as has not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time no nor ever shall be and unless those days were shortened jesus said no flesh would be saved but for the elect's sake those days will be shortened we are going to look at the word the elect's sake now we have to understand in the bible in the Bible, the whole counsel of God, we have three groups that are called the elect. Number one is the Old Testament saints. Number two is the church that is in heaven right now. And number three are those believers that will reject Antichrist and the mark of the beast. Those who are saved in the middle of the great tribulation. So when you read the elect's sake, you know Jesus is talking about those believers during the great tribulation. Remember, in Revelation chapter 7, verse 14, John writes that the great multitude of Gentiles, they will come out of the great tribulation. And remember, they'll say, Lord, avenge our blood. So these elect are those believers from the great tribulation. Now, I want you to understand when the church goes to heaven, the restraining power is gone with the rapture. But the redeeming power is still available to those who desire to accept Christ. 
The redeeming power is available during the great tribulation so we can see God's love for mankind. His great love and mercy. Even in the middle of the great tribulation, the Lord is looking for souls. God is working in the area of evangelism in the middle of the great tribulation. Remember, he sends Moses and Elijah, the 144,000. And next, in the next chapters, we will see an angel flying and proclaiming the gospel. Isn't that beautiful? That's the love of our Lord. He loves souls. Then we understand how important it is in this time of grace to share the good news with those around us. So um, we discussed in the, our last lessons that Antichrist is not going to say, here I am, look at me, I'm the Antichrist. No, he will be a great world leader, extremely clever, extremely intelligent. He will be so gifted, so bright, talented, with strong language skills. He will, um, uh, he will use advanced language, advanced vocabulary to impress all those around him. He will uh, be even very creative. Uh, his IQ scores will be really, really high, higher than 130. He will have special abilities in science and computer. Now think about especially computer because he will be able to control the whole world, not one country, the whole world. So he will have special abilities in science, computer, math, even music and arts. These are some Bible commenters are saying. So he will have tremendous brain power. Why? Well, because he was empowered by the dragon. The dragon, remember when he was cast out of heaven, he was extremely furious and angry. And that power, he's using that power to empower, to give authority to the Antichrist. I also believe he will be so handsome, talented, gifted, charismatic, that people will be so happy and joyful People will be so deceived, they will be excited and delighted. And they will say, oh, here it is, the man, the right man in power. And remember, he will have, according to Revelation 13, verse 1, he will have seven heads and ten horns. Seven heads represent the seven great empires, and we discussed that in our last lesson. And in Revelation uh, chapter 17, verse 10, a famous verse there. There are seven kings. The kings have kingdoms. Five kings have fallen. We discussed Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. They have fallen. One is, this is wrong. Because John was writing the book of Revelation during that time, during that uh, period of time. And one has not yet come, which is the revived Roman Empire. So Antichrist will lead that empire. Uh, the revived Roman Empire. Now, the, the only kingdom that will stand forever and ever is not the revived Roman Empire, but is Christ's kingdom, the kingdom of God, the final kingdom. The king of kings will come. Remember the image of Nebuchadnezzar. In uh, Daniel chapter 2, verse 34, a stone was cut without hands who destroyed the image, who destroyed all the kingdoms. Remember, the head of gold, the chest, arms of silver, the belly of bronze, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. And we discussed that. So we can say that the only kingdom that will stand forever is Christ's kingdom. And the Lord will rule over all the earth and he will rule with the rod of iron together with the saints. On the second coming, we are coming with Christ. That's why it's important to have those crowns. Remember, we can only 
get those crowns during the time of grace here, here, while you are on earth. I believe that according to our crowns, we will rule and reign. He will put us in charge of different regions and cities. That's why it's so important to serve the Lord. Many times we get so busy in serving ourselves, myself included. We have to be busy with God's work. We have to be busy because he's coming soon. And all of us, we feel that he's coming soon. We need to be ready and we need to make our friends, our relatives, our neighbors ready. Amen. Amen. Now, um, you remember the, uh, this Antichrist, he had uh, a deadly wound on one of his heads and his wound was healed. So he returned to life. And people were so amazed. They marveled. They were astonished. They were in awe. And say, no one is like the beast. You see, um, the deadly wound was healed. And the, the recovery, the recovery of the beast will increase his authority and his fame. Will add to his power. The recovery of the beast. Now, throughout history, many, many leaders wanted to revive the glory of Rome. We know, and we studied last time, that Rome fell from within. The Roman Empire lasted from 146 before Christ uh, all the way to 476 AD, Anno Domini. So that means it was a long period of time, and uh, they... They just ceased to exist. Nobody conquered them. Now, only Antichrist will be able to revive the Roman Empire because we discussed he is empowered by the dragon. He has a great power, demonic power. God sees Antichrist as a wild beast. Now, we know that we people are created in God's image. I believe Antichrist in, is created in the Satan, dragon's image. Why? We have in Revelation 11, verse 7, he comes out of the bottomless pit. Again, Revelation chapter 11, verse 7, uh, for your notes. Now we go to the false, false prophet. The false prophet's character, and we are going to read verse 11. We are going to read one verse, verse 11. Verse 11 said, I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. This is verse 11. So the same word beast is used to describe both Antichrist and the false prophet. That means they have the same origin. Now let's think about, compared to the first beast, to the Antichrist, the first beast had seven heads and 10 horns and 10 crowns. This beast has two horns. So we can say, well, he looks much nicer. And he comes out of the earth, he has two horns just like a lamb and we can say that this beast has a mild a mild lamb like appearance now when you think of a lamb let's just imagine a lamb in front of us what do we see we think of gentle and soft we want to touch that lamb soft peaceful gracious Maybe someone who is religious. So this beast looks nicer than the first beast. Is that right? It does look nice. He has two horns. That means he has authority in two realms. First, the religious realm. Second, political. But then, when we look at the end of Revelation, Jerry, verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 11. We are in Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. When we look at that verse, at the end of that verse, we see that he spoke like a dragon. In Revelation 13, verse 11, 
we see that he spoke like a dragon. He spoke like Satan, like the serpent of old. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Reading the verse again. So that means the message of the second beast is the same like the message of the first beast in spite of his lamb-like appearance. Is that true? In spite of his nice appearance. That means that the second beast is just the dragon in sheep's clothing. He speaks like the dragon. He speaks like the dragon. What does the dragon, what does Satan speak? He speaks lies, he's the father of lies. So that means this, his mouth reveals his heart. This beast will speak lies like the dragon. He will speak errors. He will deceive many. He may look like a lamb, but what comes out of his mouth reveals who he really is. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. The second beast is called the false prophet in three chapters of Revelation, we will go only to Revelation 19 verse 20, <coughs> uh, but we will find this uh, false prophet in chapter 16 verse 13 and chapter 20 verse 10. So right now we are going to read Revelation chapter 19 and verse 20. Then the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceives those who receive the mark of the beast and those who worship his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. We will study that chapter. This is when Jesus is coming on his second coming. So we can see their destination, the antichrist and the false prophet. Their future is in the lake of fire. So when the enemy comes in your mind, comes to attack you, just remind him about his destination, the lake of fire. So we go now to our second point, the, the third point, the false prophet's purpose. What is his purpose? And we go to our main text, Revelation chapter 13, verse 12. We are going to read verse 12. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. In this verse, we see his purpose very clearly. He makes the world, that means all the unbelievers, worship the Antichrist, worship the first beast. Now think about it. We have a Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, yes. And the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Christ, to worship Christ, to focus on Christ, to call attention to the Lord Jesus Christ, to our Savior, always points to Jesus. Is that right? Yes. This is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, we go, we go to the evil trio. Some Bible scholars, they call them the unholy trinity. I don't like to call them because for me, trinity is very holy. I'm going to call them evil trio, the dragon, antichrist, and false prophet. This evil trio, the dragon, Satan, Antichrist, and the false prophet, if we look at this false prophet, what is his purpose? To focus on Antichrist, is that right? He points to Antichrist. We look at our verse, verse 12. He calls attention to Antichrist and many people worship the Antichrist. So we can see a great parallel between the Holy Trinity and the evil trio. The evil trio imitates the Holy Trinity. We can see that Satan, Antichrist and the false prophet counterfeit the Holy Trinity. They imitate the Trinity. That's why it's so important to study the Bible so we'll 
don't get deceived by false prophets that are to this day all over. Now we go to the next section, the false prophets' actions, his job description. And we are going to read now verses 13 all the way to the end of the chapter. Verse 13. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he has granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and live. Verse 15. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. 16. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. And verse 17, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And the last verse, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding cal calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is six, six, six. Now, in this section, we see the false prophet's actions, job description, if you wish. Even though the <coughs> false prophet will appear gentle as a lamb, he will be able to call down fire from heaven, just like Elijah did in 1 Kings chapter 18. And if you look in the Greek, in the Greek language there, he calls fire over and over again to deceive many. He will perform signs and miracles. And we don't have a big description of what signs and miracles we have this fire coming down from heaven. So he will receive, uh, deceive the whole world. He will make the people create an image, an idol of the Antichrist. Just like Nebuchadnezzar. Remember how he made an image of, even though he, he was represented only by the head in that dream, the head of gold that represents Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar was the king, but then he made his own image, 90 feet tall, and was all gold, you see? So this false prophet will make people create that image, that idol, not only that, he will give life to that idol, to that image. Some people believe it may be just a robot. You know, technology is going so, growing so fast, we don't know. Can be just satanic. And uh, that image will be placed in the holy temple, in the new temple. I want to remind you, in the book of Job, chapter 1, Satan had tremendous power. We don't go through the whole story. We know the story. Satan even had power over the forces of nature. Remember when he caused a great wind, and that wind destroyed the house with Job's children. They were eating and drinking in that house. And he caused that great wind, and the house collapsed, and all those children were killed. Satan has tremendous power. And now he knows that that's his last days. So he increases his power. Now, uh, he wants to impress people by his powers. Um, so we see in our chapter that he will cause people, he will, he, he will force people, rich and poor, small and great, free and slaves, to receive the mark of the beast to accept that mark so no one can buy or sell without the mark. Now it's sad to say the great majority of people, they will accept the mark of the beast because they will be deceived by all those signs and miracles. 
Now, everybody except the believers in that time, will, uh, the believers, um, they will receive that mark. And what does that mean? People will not be able to do anything without the mark. For example, to buy food or clothing, to buy a house, to buy a car, to rent a car, to rent rooms, to travel, to buy gas. Nothing. You can do nothing without that beast, the mark of the beast. Now, to accept the mark is to pledge allegiance to Satan, to rebel against God. If you accept that, there's no chances that you can ever be saved. Now, we all know Christians will refuse in that great tribulation, those who come to Christ, they will refuse the mark. They will prefer to die because they know absent from the body, present with the Lord. So most people who refuse the mark of the beast will die. Uh, that reminds us of, of, us of the early church. If you remember the early church, uh, when they were required to burn incense to Caesar. Remember the church of Smyrna, the persecuted church I love when Jesus said, you are rich. Even though they were persecuted, they were poor, you are rich. They didn't burn incense to Caesar. They didn't say Caesar is Lord. They were required to just burn a little pinch of incense on the altar or, or altar of Caesar. He had a statue there. And to say Caesar is Lord. Most Christians refused that. And what happened to that, to those Christians? They were crucified upside down. They were fed to the lions. They were burned on the stake. They were burned as candles, human candles. You see? Those people were persecuted, but they refused to worship Caesar. Now we see in our text that the number of the beast is 666. This is the number of men, because man was created on the sixth day. Now many people try to identify the beast and they fail. Many books were written. Uh, now we know that in both, in Hebrew and Greek, the letters of the alphabet are used as numbers also. We don't know. I don't know what 666 means. We know it's the mark of the beast. But the lesson for us today is that a sign, a miracle, a work of wonder is not necessarily a work of God or your work from God. Satan tries to imitate God. He's the angel of light. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, he said, not everyone who comes to me and says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of God, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. You see, many will say to the Lord in that day, we prophesied in your name, we cast out demons in your name. We've done wonders in your name. And the Lord will say, I never knew you. Depart from me. That's a scary verse. Let that verse, let us meditate upon that verse this week. It's a scary verse. Then in Matthew 24, 20, verse 24, Jesus said, false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive possible, even the elect. And in this chapter, he talks about the elect during the Great Tribulation. Paul also tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter, chapter uh, 2, verse 9 for your notes, that Antichrist will come with all power, signs, and lying wonders. So again, not every sign and every miracle, every work of wonder is from the Lord. Many believers today are impressed with signs of wonders. Now listen, I want you to listen now. The real marks of God's work, the real marks of a true believer are not signs and wonders, are love and truth and the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Remember what Jesus said. You will know them by their fruit. Do men gather grapes from four bushes and figs from thistles? This is the Lord Jesus that said that. Now, we are at the end of our message. And I, say, I just want to go home 
with a few words. Teacher, preacher, too many words. I need just a few words. So let's just say a few words about chapter 13. Revelation 13 talks about two main characters. The beast out of the sea, Antichrist, and the beast out of the earth, the false prophets, prophet. Antichrist is a worldwide political leader. The false prophet is a worldwide religious leader. The dragon, or Satan, empowers both of them, gives them power and authority. Both beasts, Antichrist and the false prophet, will persecute the Jews and the believing Gentiles during the tribulation, those who refuse the mark, who refuse to worship him. Those people who refuse to worship Antichrist will be executed. Most of them will die. Just a small number will survive. This is, in chapter 13, Satan's final attempt to cause the world to worship him. His time is short. It seems that Satan is winning if we only read chapter 13. But we all know that the final victory belongs to our Lord Jesus Christ. Satan will not win. His final destination we just read is in the lake of fire. So how should we respond? What should we do today? Well, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and understand the schemes of the enemy. Study the word of God. And study the book of Revelation. Put on daily the armor of God. Fight the good fight of faith. Resist the devil and he shall flee, the Bible says. And I want you to pay attention to the next verse that the Lord spoke very clearly. I wrote every word. So I want you to focus on the next sentence, a phrase. Don't fall into Satan's trap and turn away from God when hard times come, when difficulties arise, when problems or sickness come, challenging time come, but use those times as opportunity for spiritual growth. Use those challenging times as opportunities for spiritual <coughs> growth. And ask the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to learn through this lesson? Think of Pastor George. We didn't collapse because the Lord has us in his hands. Is that right? Amen. 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 Let us pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word, Lord. Thank you for the book of Revelation, Lord. Lord, help us to watch for your coming. We know that you are coming soon. And help us to be ready for your coming. Draw us closer to you, Lord. And give us the boldness to share with those around us the good news, the gospel of grace, and the message of mercy. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen, amen. and amen. amen. amen.